so let me let me do some things that I had once or twice in job interviews too. When this dreadful question <laughs> comes from that search committee member that seem to have not paid attention to you for the last twenty minutes, and then goes, "Why does it matter?" Why should we care what happens, how the world influences us? Why should we care? Um, I'm sure you had it. I had it a few times for sure it happened to me. And it's sort of like, how do you respond to that? How, why should, I mean, it's, it's about slavery. It's about Western expansion. It's about filibusters. Why should we care about that other part of how do you define a nation based on some European example? Yeah, I think there are several different levels on which this work really helps us understand the Civil War era in a new light and in greater complexity. So starting with Southern identity and the Civil War itself, we've already talked about how this really complicates the story. It's not just brother versus brother, a domestic war. It's really a war fought on some level about competing visions of nationhood and competing ideals of nationhood. Mm -hmm. And really which of these visions is going to be the future? Is it going to be the vision of the United States with not yet a full democracy, but a fuller democracy? Or is the South going to be vindicated and their idea of a anti-democratic slaveholders republic? So it helps us complicate our notion of the Civil War. It helps us understand the Civil War as part of this larger international debate. Because again, it's not just the United States that's having this debate. It's all these other regions of the nation that we've been talking about, Europe, Latin America. These, this is really the question of the 19th century and the Atlantic world. And the United States isn't exempt from that. The Confederacy isn't exempt from that. They're fundamentally tied into this central 19th century question. So I think that's one of the major takeaways right there, mm -hmm. that the American Civil War, the US, the Confederacy are fundamentally international in their import. And that then helps us understand this age of nationalism in a different way as well. Um, the United States, certainly the Civil War, have usually been left out of histories of nationalism and the age of revolutions, which um, often kind of cuts off with 1848. And you can understand why, because the South mm -hmm. is engaging in an anti-democratic revolution here. They're not fighting for the same thing that 48 did, but they're claiming that they did. Mm -hmm. They're claiming to be the latest in this long line of nations fighting for these ideals and national independence. To them, this age of nationalism is still very much alive and they're very much a part of it. And I would argue that when the South loses and the United States vision wins out, that helps define the um, evolving impacts and results of this age of nationalism. So it helps us understand the age of nationalism can be understood more broadly as well because these ideals of nationalism weren't just one, two, three, straight in a line. They could be manipulated. They could be changed. They could be altered. They could be twisted in all sorts of ways to justify movements very different than the ones that the ideals started out with. So this book really helps us reimagine the importance of the development of Southern identity, the international aspects of the Civil War, as well as the ongoing importance and influence of the age of revolutions and nationalism. And certainly globalism too. That Absolutely. When, you, when you think of like, how often do we hear the story of like, oh, globalization is this modern thing and you look at this period and it's like, no, yeah, it took a lot or two weeks to cross the Atlantic, but people were talking, people were communicating, people were exchanging ideas. So it is, it's an incredibly connected world. And I it taught, um, yeah, I had the, finally had the opportunity to teach my international U.S. history class this semester as a senior research seminar. And I've been wanting to teach it for so long, so excited. I had the best students, but one of them I've had before, great student, um, he believes that globalism is a 20th century phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever we would talk about him taking this class, he's like, yeah, but I don't understand, you know, international U.S. history, why we're not talking about the 20th century. 
So, um, so hopefully I was able to help show him and, you know, show other readers of my book, like you say, globalism is not a modern phenomenon. Globalism really has been shaping the world much further back than we tend to think, really hopefully kind of break us out of a presentist mindset, I suppose.